This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. Uh, today, for November 9th, 2018, show number 523, we're going to talk a little bit about what we learned at the Healthy Building Summit. 2018 with myself and Nate, the uh, house whisperer, Adams. Looking forward to uh, talking in more detail with Nate again this week and uh, going over some of the key highlights from uh, two weeks ago when we had our Healthy Building Summit 2018. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. IAQ Radio Platinum Sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. I also want to thank our gold sponsors, Particles Plus, Healthy Indoors Magazine, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, and AEML Inc. Laboratory. And, of course, our association sponsors, the Indoor Air Quality Association, and the Restoration Industry Association. Okay, the Z-Man has the day off today, so no uh, no trivia question. We're going to jump right into it. Nate, do uh, we have you on the line? I'm afraid so, Joe. All right, Nate. Good to have you back. The House Whisperer is back with us again. I think most people know Nate. Nate, uh, let's, John, let's jump right into the slides from uh, our, this year's event. What a fantastic uh, event. A, a beautiful venue, by the way. We've got a photo there of Seven Springs Mountain Resort in Somerset, Pennsylvania, uh, not far from Falling Water, the Frank Lloyd Wright's famous Falling Water home, uh, built for the Kaufman family, built over a, a stream. Uh, beautiful area called the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania, and we had a great time, an eclectic mix of people. Nate, give us your overview of uh, thoughts from the conference. Uh, it's a, it, this is the only conference that I go to every year, so that's kind of an important thing, uh, because I find that every year I learn things that are not easy to find otherwise. Uh, so I'm a building scientist. I'm in home performance. So uh, learning new things, when you start digging into it, oftentimes you have to go to tangential areas. So talking to the restoration guys is absolutely fascinating. The mold remediators, uh, the researchers that you, you get to come. Uh, it's such a spectacular mix that there's always something to learn. And so I greatly appreciate that. And I noticed you put on here, learning often comes from looking at the adjacent fields. I, I couldn't agree more. We try and bring in people from different areas, the home performance, most recently with you and Linda Wigington and uh, Bill Spohn comes and uh, talks to us, so Joe Madosh. Uh, so we, we've been learning from each other. I, I think it's fantastic. And uh, a lot of those folks are getting into the indoor air quality side of home performance. So a nice mix. We also have a, a great group of uh, restoration, uh, disaster restoration professionals that come in. We've got the Z-Man, of course, Cliff Zlotnick. We had John Downey in this year, who's now uh, with Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. I, I like the fact that you say, leave your ego at the door, because, you know, we do have some pretty sharp people that show up. It's a small event, maybe 60, 65 people. I think next year we may have more like 80. Uh, but what's nice about having that small event is we, we get more time with each other, more time networking, more time answering specific questions of the people that attend. So let's go to the next slide, John. We'll go over some of the presentations. Uh, this year we had a keynote with Dr. Jordan Petcha. Most of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Petya. He joined us a few years back. He's from Yale University. Nate, key takeaways from Jordan's presentation. Uh, the thing that I found probably most interesting was that uh, according to his research, farmers tend to not get asthma, uh, much, much lower rates. One of the things that was interesting that he talked about is a standard Austrian farm. Uh, you have the house above the barn, so oftentimes you're going to have airflow rising from the barn to the house. So kids are going to breathe uh, 
lots of stuff from animals. Uh, and I thought that was really fascinating because he, he talked about how important it looks like it is for kids to be exposed to all kinds of things that we might consider toxins uh, and allergens when they are very young. So the, Take them uh, to the, the farm events, you know, let, let them crawl around in the dirt. Uh, it sounds like that's really important for developing their immune systems, and then they tend to not get asthma. Uh, he found the same thing was true in Amish populations as well. So that was fascinating. Um, a couple other things that he talked about, that there were some tests that he had done on air conditioners with different levels of filtration in them. So for starters, every air conditioner has mold. Um, it does always kind of crack me up when people are like, oh, I don't like mold. Like, well, do you like cheese? Uh, <laughs> you're eating mold. That's what makes cheese. Uh, but uh, he found that when you got to, say, a, Mer a MERV 13 filter or higher, and you didn't have a lot of bypass around the filter, the buildups on the coils were much, much less. So it tends to be a much healthier building if you put a good filter in. Um, uh, and I was selfishly, I was happy to hear that because we specify a minimum MERV 11 uh, in our projects. Okay. Um, and then the other key thing that he talked about was, uh, and this was something that had messed with me a couple of years ago when you had him on the show. Uh, I, I gave him a phone call afterwards because he was breaking our hypothesis potentially. So we like to uh, get houses dry. Um, have them well insulated and bring in fresh air. But then he talked about how uh, high levels of diversity of the microorganisms is very important to the health of the building. And like, oh man, are we going to get it too clean? Is it going to be a problem? So I called him and he remembered actually. And he said, no, it's, it's not really an issue. Lower diversity is bad for health. But lower diversity is typically caused by damp buildings because you get a few mold species that end up taking over. Uh, so you don't get the diversity. You have a small number of species that are uh, taking over the house, basically. You know, the other thing he talked about was um, something we, we talked with Dr. Karen Dannemiller about on uh, a show not too long ago, maybe a month and a half back, about uh, relative humidity and gene activation within fungi and bacteria, in particular with the fungi. He was talking about how uh, at higher relative humidities, you saw gene activation of the secondary metabolites. So you saw more uh, secondary metabolism of things like mycotoxins, et cetera, which I thought was very interesting. And um, he did a great job in general. Uh, Jordan's a great guy. And I, the thing I love about our keynotes is, they stick around and they attend the other sessions and they talk to the attendees and they, they learn uh, and they always compliment us and um, really appreciate the fact that they also learn from the practitioners. We call the, the Healthy Building Summit research to practice and, and sometimes it's the other way around, practice to research. And in fact, next year, I think we're going to change the name for at least a year to practice to research and uh, have more researchers there and maybe some of the postdocs or the people working on their postgraduate uh, degrees, see if we can't get more of them involved with industry professionals so that, you know, they can learn from us and we can learn from them and that they can then maybe do research that's more uh, immediately applicable for those of us in the field. So uh, it was great having Jordan. Uh, we were, John and I were going through it today. We have had, uh, this would be our sixth Healthy Building Summit. I've got to look over to the right. Number one, we had Sam Rashkin. Then we had uh, Hung Chung, Dr. Hung Chung, medical doctor. And then we had Jeff Siegel, Terry Brennan, and Joe Spurgeon in year four. Uh, Mark Hernandez and Tom Yacobellis in year five. And this year was Jordan Petcha and Jeff May. My house is killing me, May. Let's go to the next slide, John. And there's Linda Wigington. And I've had Linda speak at least two years, maybe three years in a row now, because I think what she is doing is so important. Um, Roxas is reducing outdoor contaminants in indoor spaces. And she's very focused on PM 2.5, particulate matter 2.5 and less. And I, I told the attendees and I, I want all the listeners to start to pay attention to this PM 2.5 issue. 
that that is really where I think our focus is going to be in the future because the, the small particulate matter, we have very good data to show that small particulate matter causes respiratory and cardiovascular issues. And I think we're going to continue to get more and more interest from consumers and industry associations about particulate matter and how to do a better job of reducing it. And it starts with outdoor because most of our indoor particulate matter comes from outdoors. Nate, some of the highlights you uh, picked up from Linda Wigington's presentation. So as far as the outdoor particles go, uh, then it becomes an issue of building tightness. So one thing I thought was really interesting she said is most buildings, if you leave the windows and doors closed, serves as effectively a MERV-13 filter. Um, I thought that was really interesting. I don't know exactly how she came up with a MERV-13 specifically and not an 8 or a 16 or something like that. Uh, but... It, one of the things that she has found, and it's kind of fun because we've been saying now for years, keep your windows closed, as frustrating as it is, and as much as we ignore it personally sometimes, it's beautiful outside, open the windows, okay. Uh, but if you open the windows of your house, the outdoor pollution is the indoor pollution. So if you are living in a polluted area, it's a problem. And something that she mentioned this year that she hadn't in the past was that... Uh, Air quality, at least in Pittsburgh, so from what she's measuring, is the worst at night and in the early morning. When do you usually have your windows open? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I was I, like, oh, nice. Right. Um, so that, that was a very important point. I, I should say, too, uh, that I'm sitting in my house. This is oh, a good. monitor. Close up one night there, yeah. What do we got? Yeah. So the dial. Yep, this is a Dylos monitor that she gave me, actually. Uh, so I've been in one of her cohorts. Um, and then uh, last year when I was there, she, she gave me one. Uh, this is a really nice monitor for watching your low levels. Uh, so this is the small right here. And then the large uh, size particles over here. Uh, the thing I don't like about this is the only way you can get data out of it is with that right there. Okay. Uh, so this is not a great thing to leave uh, around because you have to download your data every week. And I haven't downloaded data from this ever. <laughs> and I don't really intend to. But you get immediate feedback here as to what's going on. And I leave this next to my stove. Um, and we get to watch basically when we burn things in the kitchen, how badly do we screw up the air quality. Uh, and then we use a range hood. So anyway, it's an important thing to know, and this is the workhorse of her measurements uh, study. Yep, yep. She mentioned that homes with central air conditioning have the lowest readings. Now, I've kind of heard the opposite, that homes with central air conditioning have the worst indoor air quality problems. And in fact, I know Carl Grimes and uh, the people with Hayward Healthy Homes have uh, noted that in some of their findings from all the different homes they've evaluated over the years. Um, comment on that if you would, Nate. So I think they're measuring two different things there. So Hayward score, which is very worth going and trying out. So it, it takes five or 10 minutes to take the whole uh, questionnaire. And then they give you a score at the end, along with some recommendations of things to do. Um, it's, they are asking about symptomology a lot. And do you have a damp basement? Have you had any plumbing leaks? There's a lot of different questions that they ask. Uh, Linda is talking specifically about PM, particulate matter. Uh, and so I'm betting that's where the disconnect is. But from my own experience, having 40 FUBOT air quality monitors out in the field uh, in client homes, if you run the, uh, the air handler all the time, and you have a good filter in it, you're just constantly knocking particles out of the air. And uh, typically all of our houses flatline on PM 2.5. Uh, like you're gonna be in the less than five or 10 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, if I remember the, the unit correctly. Yep. Uh, so that's probably where the disconnect is. So you may have a damp building, and that may be because the air conditioner is oversized. And so it's not dehumidifying well enough. So you end up with mold and moisture problems where Linda's looking at PM. So different things. 
Well, and also I think, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I, I suspect anyhow that most of the people who agreed to be a part of their cohort, their study, are probably a little more conscientious about their homes and, and not having moisture issues or, you know, obvious moisture issues. I mean, you know, I'm sure they have those as well. But And um, I get the impression that maybe those folks are changing their filters a little more often, uh, maybe have somebody coming in looking at their mechanical system more often. So the mechanical system is probably not a mold farm to start with. But, I, you know, I could be, uh, I could be wrong, but that could be part of the, the disconnect as well. That would make sense, too, because if somebody's looking for Hayward score, they probably have an issue and they're searching for help. So they probably have a house that's screwed up where Linda's going to be pulling from general population. Yep. And probably a, a portion of the population that's more aware of, of this type of topic or this type of issue. So, all right, um, let's go to the next slide there, John. There we go. Healthy Building Summit. Now, Dr. Joe. I love Dr. Joe Spurgeon. Um, we, we had Joe come in and do another presentation. He's got a tremendous paper out that uh, we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. But, uh, Nate, give us your impressions on Dr. Joe's presentation. Uh, so now you're outside of my area of expertise and more into yours. Uh, but one thing that he's doing, which I really like, uh, you know I'm a numbers person. I like to understand what's going on with numbers, with metrics of some sort. And what he was talking about primarily was uh, indoor-outdoor comparison is not uh, a good thing in his mind in most cases. Um, he's more looking at counts of a few different things and then plotting a whole bunch of different buildings uh, that are either sick or healthy and trying to understand where uh, the tipping point might be. Uh, so it, you pull another sample on a house, is that house or that building sick or is that house or that building healthy? Uh, or is it somewhere in the middle? And I, I really enjoyed how he did this. So uh, I've met him several years in a row now, and he's one of my favorite people there. I, I, I think what's very interesting about what Joe is doing in this most recent paper, he's actually working on some, some numerical guidelines for um, slit impact or commonly referred to as spore trap type sampling of homes. And he took a, a pretty large group of homes and um, uh, some data from, a, I believe, one or maybe a couple home inspectors that were or indoor environmental professionals, not necessarily just home inspectors, out doing this type of work. And, and he, he plotted all that, and then he ended up with a um, guidance, essentially. And we'll talk more about it and get more detail with Joe as we, uh, as we get a chance down the road here. But Essentially, he's, he feels that, and I, and I tend to agree from my own experience and from working with a lot of people in the field, the Aspen, Aspergillus penicillium-like spores tend to be a good indicator of whether you have a home that has moisture issues or not. And based on Joe's research and the paper he put together and, and distributed at the event, if you're in that less than, and I don't know how you picked out this this slide, Nate, but you did a great job because this one kind of, you know, summarizes a lot of what he's saying. You look at your Aspen sample results. If you're less than 750 spores per cubic meter, you know, that's typical indoor air, pretty common. If you're between 750 and 1,500, now you're talking about kind of that intermediate range where it's probably worth taking a little closer look and trying to figure out why you're over that 750. If you're above 1500, he's saying that's contaminated air based on the research that he has done. And I think that's a pretty common, uh, you know, I've seen people use 2000. I've seen people use a thousand, but you know, he actually did the research on it and you know, did the statistics, and this is what he came out with. And um, I, I love what Joe does and, and the great work that he's doing and trying to help people do a better job of using true industrial hygiene principles to help with determining whether or not a building has issues. Uh, great stuff. He, uh, I like that you also noted here, he's not big on inside-outside comparisons, but he does still use outside samples, and I'll let him explain how and why on a later date. 
um, but he does promote using metrics and professional judgment to determine if the building has high airborne mold levels. Now, this is just airborne sampling. He's not talking about uh, tape lifts or uh, swabs, which he also has good data on and uh, good books on, and we'll be talking a lot more with Joe in the future. So uh, you picked out a great slide, Nate. I did my best, Joe. I, I don't know if you realized it or not, but that's that's the one that kind of sums <laughs> that, it all up, buddy. Let's go to the next one there, John. Ah, oh, this guy here, you got to love it. <laughs> Carl Grimes, Hayward Healthy Homes. Uh, Carl Grimes, is uh, many of our listeners know Carl. He's been on this show many times. He's a, I don't know, he's kind of the philosopher of the indoor air quality world. Um, he. He did a presentation on what is health. Um, you know what what is health? How do we define health? And he's actually working on a committee, uh, an ASHRAE committee, put together to help try and define health. Because when they look in all the literature, there aren't any really good definitions for health. Right now, most people use the old World Health Organization definition, which is I think. And I'm, off the top of my head, 40 or 50 years old, and it doesn't necessarily work as well as some would like. So Carl, the being the, the philosopher for indoor air quality, decided to do a presentation on what is health and ask the question, and we started to try and answer it, but uh, it's a tough question. Hey. Uh, he's our philosopher king. Uh, so his first slide, I looked at it, remember I asked him like, so I, that's a very artistic slide you have going there. He's like, uh, that one might be, but after that, it's just uh, bl black fonts on white background. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, I enjoy how he thinks. He thinks very differently from me. Um, and he, he challenges people to challenge their assumptions and their thinking. And typically that's where leaps come from. So I appreciate the Carl's over at Hayward Healthy, uh, the, well, Hayward Score, sorry, and Hayward Healthy. Hayward Health. Score, yeah. Go to haywardscore.com and get your score. It's a fascinating, it's a really interesting process to go in and get your score and, and see what, I mean, most of the listeners are pretty good with indoor air quality issues and pretty good with building science. Well, we'd be curious to see what your feedback is. It's free. You can go in, get your score, compare it to your wife's thoughts on her score and or your um, kids or your significant other, whomever it may be, and, and then start a discussion about how to make your home healthier. I think that's the whole point be, be, uh, behind the Hayward score is let's get the discussion going. Let's go to the next one here, John. Okay, Dr. Alice DeLee. That is not Alice. Uh, that is me. I don't know what happened there, John. <laughs> It, it had a picture of her first slide, so that's why I put you in there. Uh, okay, there you go. That's Nate pulled that out, not John. All right, go for it. Tell, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on Alice. Dr. Alice, she's the uh, laboratory director at PRISM Labs. Um, they're part of a, another bigger lab, Montrose, now. But go ahead, Nate. Uh, so it, she confirms a, a lot of uh, the research that I've seen. So uh, Dr. Rich Corsi, who was at University of Texas, Austin, and is now in Portland. I can't remember yep. uh, the, the name of the university at the moment. He just switched a few months ago. So he was one of the first to connect VOC or volatile organic compounds off-gassing with humidity. And so uh, uh, Dr. Alice confirmed that. Um, and... Uh, I thought that was interesting, but also she said that higher temperature also drives uh, VOC off-gassing, which I hadn't connected dots with before. So it's, it's always good to learn the extra couple of things. Another thing that she talked about was that odor does not indicate risk. So just because something stinks doesn't mean that it's going to kill you. Um, and I thought that was curious. Um, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, the, the cat's litter box in my house is not going to kill me. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> No, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, that has other issues, I know. Um, but then she did uh, uh, follow that up and say, if you're smelling uh, moldy smells, so MVOCs, microbial VOCs, that almost always indicates mold. 
So you do have an issue if you smell mustiness. You either have or had actual growth occurring in that space. Uh, you have it. You smell it pretty, you know, pretty commonly. If you had it, then it may have been absorbed by any number of things in the home, and now it's it's kind of uh, re off gassing, uh, so to speak. Correct. Uh, and then she also talked about low VOC paint, which was following up on what uh, Dr. Jeff Siegel had said a couple of years ago as well, that just because it says low VOC or no VOC doesn't mean that it's truly low or no VOC. It just means that uh, there are none of the chemicals on the VOC list in that particular uh, can of paint, but there may be some other chemicals that are worse or better uh, involved because I, I thought it was interesting. Dr. Siegel a couple of years ago said basically paint your house and don't live there for two months. Uh, right. well, he, he, got days in. <laughs> yeah, he got to do that because he was painting the house and still living with his in-laws or something like that. So it was yeah. a different option. Um, Ventilate it real well. I mean, it's, you know, there's smart things you can do, uh, but uh, I, I, I agree. I thought that was very interesting. Let's go to the next one here, John. Okay, Lisa Rogers, got to love Lisa. First year she's been at the event, and I'm glad we had her. She talked about uh, behind the scenes at the ASTM D22 standards creation. They're actually working on a standard now, uh, drafting a post-remediation verification consensus standard for fungi. Uh, so a mold clearance standard. Nate, thoughts? Again, you're outside of my uh, area of expertise by a pretty good margin. Um, but what I took from this was totally different from maybe what she meant, so not entirely. Uh, she was talking a lot about the process of building consensus. So you put a bunch of people together and you just start hammering things out and it takes a long time. Uh, one of the other standards she had helped with took eight or 10 years before it came out the other side. But at first, you think there's no way that we're all going to agree on anything. It's not going to happen. Why are we even trying? Um, and you go through a couple of rounds, and you start looking for the themes and the, the points of agreement, and then you start narrowing in on them. And if you give it enough time and everybody is open and actually trying, you can come to a consensus. And that was really helpful for me because I'm seeing that in a lot of other areas of my professional life right now. Um, how important consensus is and how personally I kind of suck at coming to it because <laughs> I, I, I run out of patience for it. But uh, she just kept hammering on how important it was to keep working towards consensus because if you try, even on something where you don't think there's common ground, you will find it. You know, you were not alone in that. Um, you know, we had people from the restoration industry that attended, and at the end of, I uh, can't remember if it was day, I think day two, we had a, um, a town hall called Beyond S500. And I had a couple of the restoration guys say, you know, I'm, I'm not that interested in this topic of PRV following a mold job. I, I do more disaster restoration, but they said they found the talk interesting for a lot of the same reasons you did. Um, building consensus was important, but I think also they found that just understanding better how standards are developed and how uh, time consuming it can be and, and what goes into developing a, a good commonly used standard uh, was of interest to them and they felt they learned something and that maybe they were uh, going to be a little less critical in the future of um, some of the standards out there and some of the people developing them. So I, I thought it was a good, uh, you know, I thought it was a pretty good uh, takeaway from that particular presentation. It's always great to have Lisa. Let's go to the next one. Uh -huh. Dana, this is day two keynote. So I'm going to stop here for just a second, just to mark a note. Uh, John, I think here's where we'll put half time, but we can put it in after the show because Nate's going to have to leave. All right. So our day two keynote was Jeff May, author of My House is Killing Me, I Think My Office is Killing Me, and just a, a fascinating guy. Um, he's got a, a really strong chemistry background. Uh, uh, he is also former home inspector, 
Uh, he is also someone who has uh, developed chemical sensitivities over the years. So he's the type of person that rather than just, um, you know, oh, I got this problem and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to have to live with it. He's been, he's been trying to help others that have the same problem. He still does indoor air quality investigations. And he's really, really interested in not just the um, fungi and bacteria in indoor environments, but Jeff focuses a lot on the other critters uh, like the mites, the, the mold mites and the dust mites and the other mites that also are found in damp indoor environments. And, and I, I firmly believe that he is on to something and others that say, you know, it's not just the mold or just the bacteria, but it's this chemical soup of uh, microbial organisms that make damp homes unhealthy, essentially. Thoughts, Nate? Uh, yeah, tie a lot of things together there. So uh, Dr. Jordan Pesha was saying very similar things the first day. We don't understand why damp buildings are bad. We just know that they are. And we're not much closer to understanding why than we were 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, there's some things that we've begun to understand, but uh, the typical case of the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And I think that's part of what Dr. Pesher was saying. And then also uh, Jeff May, it was really good to get to meet Jeff because uh, we actually uh, are, both have columns in Healthy Indoors magazine. So I know Allison Bales, um, but I hadn't met Jeff yet. And so a couple things he talked about, he talked about uh, to open how fiberglass actually can support mold. And it supports mold because dust tends to collect on the fibers. So the fibers themselves are inorganic. They can't support mold. Uh, but the issue is everything gets dirty. And uh, then he was talking about how uh, there's different types of mites besides dust mites. I don't remember what the name of them was now uh, that are typically present. And they oftentimes aren't picked up by allergy tests. So they're, they're I mean, there's only in anything you do, there's only so much stuff you can test for. In the building science world, there's only so much stuff I test for. And then you yep. have to take those as proxies and interpolate between them to see is there a problem or not. Uh, and I thought that was really fascinating because that was very much what I have seen too. I've seen some really gross fiberglass, uh, particularly in crawl spaces that are damp. Uh, we don't have a ton of them in both of our environments. We usually have basements. But there's some crawl spaces, and then you go south, and most houses don't have basements. They have crawls, and they are just filthy and gross and unhealthy. And oftentimes, HVAC is down there, and HVAC's always leaky, so you are breathing what's in your crawl space. Uh, that's actually what started Bill Hayward on his whole thing. Um, that's right. He uh, did the lemon pledge test, I believe it was. Yeah, uh, exactly. Sprayed some lemon pledge in the crawl space, uh, or he had – I think his wife was in the crawl space, whichever way it was, spraying lemon pledge to see if the person upstairs could smell it. They immediately smelled it and realized, yes, my crawl space air is communicating with my indoor air quality on my first floor and my second floor, essentially. So very interesting. By the way, um, Jeff also spent a good bit of time, and we won't be able to uh, – go over much of it here, but he talked about staining and how to evaluate different types of stains and how to investigate indoor air quality and use the type of stain to help you determine what the issue might be. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, great presentation. Always great to see Jeff. Uh, Jeff May is just a fantastic, great speaker and a very knowledgeable guy. Um, one other thing I was trying to remember with Jeff. There were two things that I still had. Uh, one was that, uh, UV lights are not effective. Yeah. Uh, there just isn't anywhere near enough power involved. They need to be a hundred times more powerful to actually make a difference because uh, you needed two or four seconds of dwell, uh, dwell time before it would kill something. And they're going through there at a couple hundred feet per second. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be helpful. Yeah. 
You mentioned they're okay on a coil where you have that, you know, continue with where the air is not coming through. The air is coming through, but that's not the point of the UV light there. The point being the coil itself. And I know the other point I wanted to make, fiberglass. It's not just crawl spaces, Nate, and you know this as well as anybody. A lot of people think that fiberglass is an air barrier. And so I just happened today, I happened to be getting some new windows, pulled off a piece of the uh, molding around the window, and there's somebody had stuffed fiberglass in there. And of course, it's filthy because it's collecting the dirt in the air that's coming around my window. So um, very important to understand that it's probably not just collecting dirt. It's probably also growing a little bit of mold in there and other things as well. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, that's, that's a wonderful point. And so we jokingly call it fiber filter sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can buy fiberglass filters for your HVAC. Uh, fiberglass is not an air barrier as we've talked about on <laughs> the other episodes we've done together. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting was that uh, PCO, uh, my mind's blanking in what it stands for. Well, catalytic oxidation. Thank you. Um, it tends to be number one, ineffective, and number two, tends to create ozone, which oftentimes creates uh, substantially worse VOCs than what you were trying to remove in the first place. Um, yeah. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff was pretty negative. Well, and, you know, uh, those technologies have a place. The problem is they're missold. Um, you know, selling a UV light that goes into return air is a total waste of money. And in fact, it's going to cost you more because you're going to end up having to replace the thing or, um, you know, dispose of it or whatever. Uh, you know, PCO, it has its place, but probably not in a residential mechanical system. I think that was the, the point Jeff had to make. Yep. All right, let's go to the next one here, John. By the way, John, you got to have faith. Also did our audio and video at the show. Man, it came out great. We're going to, you know, unfortunately, when we play video on Zoom, it doesn't come out the way we would like. Uh, but we're going to have some, some nice uh, videos that John and I are working on that we'll put up for folks that they can watch. Uh, one's going to be a little summary of the Healthy Building Summit, and then one will be just a few clips of some of our speakers. But Oh, wait, I know this guy, Nate Adams, the house whisperer. Uh, the coming mold explosion. Nate, you've talked about this on the show, but just real quick, maybe you could give a little highlight from your own presentation. Well, you guys were joking earlier that I look angry here. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on, of, of all the, the shots, you had to pick that one. Um, <laughs> well, what, what I was talking about was uh, how – I have been noticing a confluence of factors uh, that a lot of the people in my world are saying that the number of mold calls they're getting. So in home performance, mold calls are not the first thing we get. It's usually comfort issues, uh, might be dampened in some place, but mold is usually not crazy high on the list. And all of them have been telling me, boy, this year, just seeing things I've never seen before. Uh, so I just step back to think about what, is involved there and then built uh, a case, I think, about it. I didn't have, uh, I don't think anybody put a dent in the argument. Um, but then again, this is a group of people that get paid to remediate molds. So if I tell them more molds coming, they're not going to mind. They weren't scattered by that at all. <laughs> but uh, uh, it talked about how dew points are up, uh, nighttime temperatures are up, uh, high rainfall events are up, which strain foundations. Um, uh, how shading is beginning to enter into the equation when you have trees getting taller, how HVAC systems do a worse job of dehumidification than they have in the past, and then how different types of modern building materials, engineered building materials, uh, are much more moisture sensitive. So if you give them a dry environment, you can have more problems than you would with, say, a 1920s home. You know, I got a question for you, Nate. I've been playing around, you know, and I've been really focused on dehumidification, 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 because, you know, I'm here in uh, Pennsylvania and, you know, between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia here up on the mat, you know, and we're in this beautiful, you know, I, I, it's sort of like Kentucky, but maybe a little bit colder, beautiful mountainous area. You know, lots of trees and lakes and streams, and it's a very rural area. But anyway, 
um, I have found that if I set my dehumidifiers at 55, this year they started in actually late March. And I just turned them off because they the home is just now on its own at 55% or below. Uh, so they ran almost nonstop from, you know, let's say April to November. So what's that? April, May, June, July, August, September, October. I mean, it's seven months. Yeah. We were well above 55% um, relative humidity. And that's here in Pennsylvania. And, and I can imagine as you go south, I know in Maryland, it's, it's been very hot and humid. The further south you go, the more, you know, the more of a problem that becomes. But anyway, after running it all year, I took it apart to clean it. I don't think a lot of people think about this, but if you ever think about what a re dehumidifier is, that thing was so loaded with mold. It was just unbelievable to me. It blew my mind uh, how bad dehumidifiers get in just one season. Now, I knew this was an issue, but until I actually took my own and tore it apart and cleaned it, and they're not easy to tear apart and clean. And then I started thinking about all these people we tell, you got to put a dehumidifier in your basement. You got to run a dehumidifier. But we don't always tell them you need to clean that dehumidifier, at least annually, if not more often. It was growing on the dirt and dust that collects on the plastic. Most of them are plastic. There are some metal parts. The coil needed cleaning out. So I think that's something we're going to have to add in the future to our recommendations, not just to add dehumidification, but to clean it. And they're not easy to clean. Um, it's, it's, and it's not something that I think uh, the average homeowner is going to do and be knowledgeable about. So I want to make a little YouTube video on cleaning your dehumidifier. Thoughts? That sounds like a good idea. The other thing that's coming to mind for me, so a, a dehumidifier is an air conditioner. Yes, it is. Um, but in, so you have two coils. The first coil takes out the heat and the humidity, and then the second coil adds the heat back in. Uh, so you end up with air that's a little bit warmer coming out than what you put into it. Um, so it, that connects back to Dr. Pesha's uh, presentation and how having a better filter is important. And... Uh, we, we end up using ultra air dehumidifiers quite a bit and I'm not paid by them, uh, but we do use them. I've got one in my basement. Um, mine just fired a couple of days ago, but man, it's, it, it's November and the thing is still firing. Yep. Uh, uh, what do you have it set at? Do you have a set point or do you just have it on? I have it set pretty low because the, the thermostat on it tends to be wrong. So it tends to read two to four degrees higher than what other thermostats will. And gotcha. when you're managing for relative, you have to turn it down. So I'm usually setting it in the 40s somewhere. Oh, uh, wow. Low 40s, sometimes high 40s. But that may work out to 55, like where you're setting. Gotcha. Uh, particularly as the basement gets cold in the summertime. Okay. Uh, but uh, what those do have, they have a good filter on the front of them. Yes. Uh, so that will be helpful. So I hadn't thought about the, the mold side of things. But that's another reason to use a bigger, better dehumidifier that has a filter built in. It's a good filter. And I also find the buckets get moldy. Um, the, the coil, of course, got moldy. The, uh, everything. I, when I tore that apart, everything had mold in it. I mean, it was just fascinating to me. I'm sure it's, you know, something others have thought about. I'm not the first one to see this, but they're not easily cleanable either, especially the blower. A little fan in there, you know, a little squirrel cage um, fan in there. It's very hard to clean. Uh, fortunately, I had some uh, a product here that's used on coils that I was able to use and get get those pretty clean and flush them out a little bit with a, a water flush. And I have a HEPA vacuum, but I took it outside and I cleaned it. And I cleaned it right. I don't think too many people can do that. So I think we need to think about that recommendation on indoor air quality of using a dehumidifier but not only using it and you know you can't throw it away well you can't throw it away every year and use a new one certainly that'd be very wasteful but also very expensive yeah at that point you should consider an expensive one um a little better one that might have a better filtration i'm going to be curious to see after you tear yours apart what you think so i'm assuming <laughs> you're going to tear it apart now <laughs> uh, you know what happens when you assume joe 
I, I <laughs> makes me look bad. Anyway, hey, I know you had a hard stop. If you got to run right now, thanks so much for joining us, Nate. I'll wrap this up on my own. But uh, as always, Nate, the house whisperer, Adams. Thanks, buddy. Always great to see you. All right, John. Let's go to the next one. Oh, yes. Felicia, Dr. Ciancirulo out of Carlo College, a local local girl, wonderful person. Uh, we always love having Felicia. She was talking about the effects of flooding on pre-existing mold spores within drywall sold by distributors, a two-year study she had done. Um, you know, I've seen this kind of study before, but it wasn't as uh, thorough as the one that Felicia did. And, and the, the thing that she did, I think, that was um, really important for future research is she developed a uh, mechanism and a way of testing the drywall as it got wet. She went to uh, Oak Ridge National Labs. She was working with them. Uh, they have a, a house down there that they flood and then they test it to see what happens after flooding and the cleanup after flooding. And she put together her own little test box, essentially, for testing drywall. So uh, the, big, the big thing that she thought was a takeaway from her presentation wasn't so much the fact that they did find mold growth and they did find certain types of mold growth, but the important thing was how to do this kind of testing in the future. And the other key takeaway, I would say, was that it took less time than I think many of us uh, have been led to believe for the infamous stacky botrys to grow on this uh, drywall. Uh, I believe it may have been uh, within 10 days to two weeks. And I, I've heard people say that, you know, it can take months and maybe it can at times, but uh, she did get growth. A little quicker than I thought. Um, now I've heard people say 10 days in the past, but recently I've seen a lot of people talking about well, how hard it is to grow mold on, on drywall and to get the stacky blotcher score would take at least a month or maybe more. And uh, that didn't bear out in Dr. Ciancirulo's uh, research. Let's go to the next one, John. Oh, the Z-Man. <laughs> you got to have the Z-Man. Cliff talked about out-of-the-box remediation this year. And uh, he focused a lot on the Pittsburgh Protocol, which was a, 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 a protocol for cleaning. It was started out to be basements after flooding. And uh, it started after some flooding we had here in Pittsburgh. He was asked to uh, try and find a more economical way to clean a rectory at a church that had been flooded. And now the Floor joists were covered with mold. It ended up becoming what we call the Pittsburgh Protocol, which has since morphed into other uh, protocols. We won't say uh, the name because they didn't give him proper recognition when they did it. Um, there is also now a FEMA document on cleaning after flood damage. The key takeaways here are, uh, number one, using foaming. Um, they sell these foamers that, that came from the uh, pesticide application world. Um, you foam up your product sort of like a shaving cream, put that on the surface. That way when the, the restoration or the cleaning guys are going to work, they, they are protected better because the foam captures a lot of the particulate. And, and we use uh, pressure washing, um, you know, low power pressure washing, just Go to IAQ Radio and um, pull up, you know, there's a search box on the right-hand side there. Go down in there and put in uh, the Pittsburgh Protocol or put in Zlotnik, and uh, you'll be able to find a couple shows we've done on this in the past. But uh, Cliff did a great job, as always, on some out-of-the-box remediation techniques. John, let's go to the next one. Uh, Joe Madosh, all right. Air leakage is a contaminant pathway. Building science meets IAQ. I wish I could do Joe's presentation. Um, uh, I, I wish I could show you more than what I have right now because the PowerPoints Joe used were just phenomenal. He, he's a really good presenter, and he's really good with uh, computers and graphics. 
And essentially what he was showing is, is how important contaminant pathways and pressurizations are when you're evaluating indoor air quality. And uh, I guess the one thing that really got people thinking was he, he showed how when you run your dryer, you're drying your clothes, how it takes basically all the air in your home out of your home. And now you've got to recondition that air. But it also showed the pathways um, and what happens when you start to dry your clothes. And again, he had illustrations in there that were just phenomenal. Uh, Joe's a, a really talented speaker. He's with the uh, Hayward Score Group now, but um, did a really nice job of helping us understand air leakage and pathways for indoor environmentalists. Next up. Ah, uh, there's the guy, Kevin Kennedy. Kevin joined us at the last minute. So thankful he could be there. Kevin um, wasn't expected to be there, but he came. He's checked Kevin, for those of you that don't know, is with uh, Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. And Kevin talked about using data to connect health and housing. Fascinating presentation. They're doing some work on using essentially um, drive-by inspections to help pinpoint locations, even down to specific homes that are more likely to have children in them with asthma and allergy issues. Fascinating presentation, working with some of the big hospitals and insurance companies and using you know, trying to be able to screen quickly for where to focus resources. Uh, Kevin's fascinating, and I, I thought his presentation was something that, you know, we, we should be able to take what he's, and, and not just him, but um, the people working with him and that he works for, take that same method and find ways to uh, pinpoint locations and specific homes where we need to provide help for people more quickly than we probably are right now. Um, I think if you took what he's doing and the Hayward score stuff and put them together, you might be able to find some really uh, interesting information there that would lead us to do a better job quicker in locating homes that have problems and or buildings that have problems. Next up, John. Bill Spohn, gotta love Bill. Bill's with True Tech Tools. Bill talked about the low cost sensor revolution. And, you know, this is a really fascinating topic. We've covered quite a bit here on IAQ Radio. And in fact, earlier in the uh, presentation today, <clears throat> excuse me, Nate pulled out one of his low cost sensors, the Dylos. And uh, Bill went through some of the research on the different low cost sensors and which ones seem to be performing better than others. Um, the, the one that really stuck out in my mind is the Fubot, is uh, another low cost sensor. It's wrapped around the leg, unfortunately, John, um, that we can use to help give a, a quick immediate essentially um blue green you know green yellow red indicator for the air quality in your home it does uh vocs total vocs which we all know is kind of a, one of these uh temperature relative humidity and particulate and it's tested out pretty well in the research in fact we did a show with uh Jacques Toulin, uh one of the founders of the food bot program here and uh, there's the poop the food bot right there nice uh in fact my air well as i moved it my my air quality went from uh blue to red i don't know if you can yeah you can see the blue in there but uh it'll change so if, if you're cooking or let's say you're running the uh, sweeper and you don't have a high efficiency sweeper you'll see immediately the color change on this unit and it will help you recognize the types of activities you perform that may be increasing your particle level or your um, carbon, uh, I'm sorry, your uh, moisture, um, relative humidity, uh, VOC. So uh, we're going to see a lot more of these in people's homes. And Bill helped us to kind of understand the pros and cons of the different types and talk a little bit about the pricing on them and 
how people are using them. Great presentation by Bill from True Tech Tools. Let's go to the next one, John. And of course, we had our town halls. And I want to thank Pete Consigli, the Restoration Industries Global Watchdog, for his assistance. We had a town hall on day one um, on IEQ related issues, primarily talking about how we evaluate whether a project was completed or not, talking about the value of different types of sampling after a project is completed. We had uh, another, pro another one on uh, restoration related issues. We call it Beyond S500. In the photo from uh, my left to right are the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick, myself, Pete, the Restoration Industries Global Watchdog, Consigli, and John Downey. John Downey is the editor of the new Siri. Uh, Siri's putting out a quarterly uh, journal with research on it. Uh, Cleaning Industry Research Institute. Siri is an interesting group that I think we're going to be hearing a lot more from. John is the new executive director of Siri. All right, let's wrap this up. We've got a couple other things just to show you some of the other things going on at the event. Every evening we have a hospitality suite where we meet and greet all the attendees. That's always a big hit. Next up, we show some of the research. Uh, in this case, that's Danny Hunt with, I think, Tom Grillo and myself. We're setting up some of the uh, hotel rooms where we do some research on engineering controls. This year, we were looking at different engineering controls. We had particle counters in different parts of the room to see, you know, does it really only clean in the middle of the room or does it clean in the bathroom? In this case, that's a particle counter we put in the bathrooms. We used one air filtration device in the middle of the room, look to see how well it cleaned in the bathroom. Of course, we covered up the HVAC system, uh, the vents and the uh, grills on the HVAC system. We'll have more information on the results later in the year here. Next up, uh, this is just showing them we positively pressurized the room. We had a room with just scrubbing. We had a room with scrubbing where we rotated the scrubber. We tested, uh, if you go back a couple, John, go back one more. Yeah, in the middle there, you can see, I believe there, they're testing for the micometer. That's the first year we've used the micometer. We also tested with the Instascope, and Alice D'Elia tested for VOCs using Prism's um, little sampler. You can see on that little round table there, that's the Prism sampler. We also, of course, had the Particles Plus guys there, Tom Grillo, doing particle counts throughout. There's one of the Particle Plus units in the bathroom. So... We've done a lot of research, and we had some wonderful entertainment this year. The first time we had a full band, normally we just have somebody playing a little guitar. A couple years back, we had Steve Sauer on the, on the uh, keyboards, plus Dan Barry. I want to thank Dan for joining us and helping with the sign this year. Most importantly, I want to thank uh, – we, we, we had the Atlanta – group come up we had uh, a really nice little band and dave mason i want to thank dave the restoration dave mason for uh, helping us bring the band up and uh, dave had actually performed with the band he's a really good uh, guitar player and he does a little singing as well they had a nice four-piece band with the keyboard player the lead singer guitar bass player drummer uh, just a fantastic time where, um, you know, we got some people out on the dance floor, too. We uh, had the band both evenings this year. It went very well. And let's see if we got any more there, John. That's a wrap. All right. So that kind of gives you an overview of what we did at the Healthy Building Summit 2018. Hopefully you learned a few things. We gave you a couple pointers from each of our presentations. Hopefully you'll be able to join us next year. 2019 will be our seventh Healthy Building Summit. Uh, we're working on some really interesting things for next year. We uh, try and add a little bit every year. So hopefully we'll see some listeners or more listeners. We had a really nice crowd there this year. We don't get more than try and keep it below about 75 people because uh, we like to have that, you know, interaction um, with the, both the researchers and the practitioners working together and talking together and going to you know, we do research there. They work together then. We go to the hospitality suite. We talk about it then. 
then of course we have the other activities uh, and Seven Springs, I uh, want to thank them. They're always wonderful hosts. So this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks so much to this week's guest, Nate Adams, the house whisperer. Uh, John, you got to have faith at the controls. Of course, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick, who was a big help at the event. Uh, most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. Great to, uh, you know, give us a like on YouTube or Facebook. Give us a little comment on the YouTube. I want to shout out to the person that commented on Nate's show last week. Uh, he did a great job for us, and I really want to thank Nate one more time. So this is Radio Joe Hughes saying we'll see you next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.